Welcome to our Sunday morning worship service. morning I share our call to worship with you all. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God give you the grace never to sell yourself short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to remember that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. So may God take your minds and think through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. And may God make your hearts and set them on fire. Amen. Amen. Shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. 
Okay, well at this time I'd like to invite all the children, the cherubs, and any children out there or young at heart, you don't have to be a child of age, to come on up here uh, and sing with me, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. <laughs> Jesus loves me, this I know. Hey, boys and girls, good morning. How is everybody today? Are we awake? Let's try that one more time. We good over there? Yes? All right. Well, I was getting ready because this week's a big week. It's a holiday week, and I am all ready for St. Patrick's Day. So I have my green cookies and my leprechauns. No? All right. It's not St. Patrick's Day? Wait, wait. Cinco de Mayo. No? No? All right. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is it? Oh, I know. I know. It's almost 2018. It's New Year's. No? No? What is it? What, 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 what is it? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. You're right. So, all right. Now, boys and girls, I have a question for you. So, Thanksgiving, what do you guys do for Thanksgiving? Yes. All right, so you have turkey, yes. You spend time with your families, yes. You give, you give thanks for your families. You go to your grandma's house, yes. All right, so yeah, so when you have Thanksgiving, when you have Thanksgiving, stop, yes. Oh yes, we're up there, aren't we? All right, so at Thanksgiving time, we have everybody around a big table, right, in your family. And at the first Thanksgiving, actually, the people who were hosting Thanksgiving, please take that off, Samantha, thank you. The people who were, who were hosting the first Thanksgiving, actually, the pilgrims, the pilgrims, the, the men and the women who were having Thanksgiving, Jillian, did not have, they did not have, they were not the ones cooking the meal. Did you know that? The people who actually were bringing most of the food were the Native Americans, were the Indians. And the pilgrims, without the Native Americans, without the Indians coming to help them, is the pilgrims were in a new land. And they didn't know the land very well. They didn't have a lot of food. They didn't know what crops grew well in America. And so without the Indians' help, they wouldn't have been a great feast for Thanksgiving. And what the Indians did was they were good neighbors. Even though they didn't speak the same language as the pilgrims, even though their skin color was a little different, the Indians looked at these people who were really struggling, who were actually starving in many cases, and they said, you know what? These people aren't of our tribe. These people weren't born with us, but we're going to help them. We're gonna teach them how to farm. We're gonna share our blessings with them because that's the beautiful and loving thing to do. Now, Jesus talked a lot. When you think about, and you're sitting around your Thanksgiving table, and you're thinking about who you're thankful for, and you're thinking about all this yummy food, and that we're lucky to have food, I want you to think about if Jesus were at your Thanksgiving. Can you think with me for a minute? Boys and girls, can I see your eyes? Yeah. If Jesus were at your Thanksgiving dinner, who do you think he would have at your Thanksgiving table that might be different than the people in your family? Yeah. He might have a lot of different people at the Thanksgiving table, right? I love your rainbow slinky, that is awesome. And so, I want you to be thinking about not only Thanksgiving as 
a time we celebrate with turkey and mashed potatoes and cranberries and whatever else you like uh, to eat on Thanksgiving. But to think about all the people around God's table and who God welcomes and invites, because it's everybody, isn't it? It's every person from every country who God says, in love, in the name of Jesus, I invite you to be part of my family. So as we're saying things that we're thankful for this Thanksgiving, be thinking about how we can share around our table and in our lives the love of God with all God's family, all right? Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, boys and girls, thank you so much. Have a great Thanksgiving. Gobble, gobble. Please join in singing verse 2 of Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me still today, walking with me on my way, wanting as a friend to give light and love to all who live. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so.
Good morning. First Thessalonians chapter 5, 1 through 11. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like the thief in the night. When they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them, as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and there will be no escape. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the, dark, of the night or of darkness. So let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who are drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has destined us, not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up each other, as indeed you are doing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. My brothers and sisters, good morning. My name is Jim Olson. I am the acting associate conference minister serving the Fox Valley Association and the Chicago Metropolitan Association of the Illinois Conference of the United Church of Christ. I promise it all fits on my business card. <laughs> Pastor Scott said to you this morning that uh, it's my goal to visit every one of the 49 Fox Valley Association congregations within about 18 months of my beginning date. I've been on this position since last September. I'm just past the one year mark. I have 12 more churches to visit. <laughs> if this is Tuesday, it must be Belgium. Some Sundays I really, I have no idea where I am. I just follow the navigation computer and I get there and I see familiar people and it's like, oh, that's where I am this morning. The churches are distinctive. Each one of you has a different character. Some are large, some are small, some are a little more conservative. Some I wonder if they actually ever say the word Jesus. <laughs> and it's a joy. It is a joy to be in this position. I've been a parish pastor, I have been a seminary lecturer, I've been the Associate Dean of Religious Life at a major uh, East Coast University. I've never been so happy in this job because I get to go and be in a different place every Sunday with you. I get to see the church at its best. I get to hear wonderful music. I get to hear great preaching sometimes. I get to see the church at its worst. When people lose sight of what's really important. And I get to help be with the churches and with the people and with their pastors in the midst of those moments. It is a true honor and joy and privilege to serve in this role. It's a little harder to explain to former congregational churches what I do and why you should care. 
<laughs> the German churches understand it a little bit more. Congregationalists, you folks are a little bit more independent. Historically, I am from the Congregational Church. I grew up at the First Congregational Church of Randolph, Massachusetts, founded in 1651. So I know this place. I've learned how to be in the former E&R churches, but I know this place. I know what motivates you. I know how you work sometimes. I get to represent you to the larger church, to the association, to the Illinois Conference, 268 churches across the northern two-thirds of Illinois, and to the denomination, about 5,600 congregations in all 50 states, 39 conferences, 187 associations. I get to be the conduit for all the amazing, wonderful things that our national church is doing. And if you haven't heard of the three great loves yet, you will. Our national church is an amazing thing. It is diverse and it is crazy and I have no idea how it still works after almost 60 years, but it does. I get to bring words of hope. I get to preach in a different church every Sunday so you never get bored with my sermons. And I get to say thank you. Your support, your OCWM basic support, our church's wider mission, and all of the other things that you send to the national church help. This is a big congregation. You help other smaller churches. And hopefully we help you as well. That basic support, who's the treasurer? Who writes the check? Are you here this morning? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> that OCWM check that you write that, and you send off to the denomination pays my salary, health insurance, gas. I am the living embodiment of that support that you give. And I get to come and do installations and ordinations and farewells. And I get to help with others on the Illinois Conference staff and on the national staff to help guide the church into a as of yet uncertain and sometimes frightening but God-filled future. So thank you for your support. Thank you for your basic support. Are you a five for five church? Fantastic. Uh, being a five for five church means that you have donated to all five of the national do uh, fundraisers for a variety of things. And I'm not going to try to list them off this morning because I hadn't prepared to do that. <laughs> but go up on the UCC website, ucc.org. Look up five for five. You're going to be a five for five church this year. You'll get a wonderful certificate next year at annual meeting. I'm also here to make an invitation to you, to the members of this church. Be involved in the United Church of Christ beyond this local congregation. There are teams and committees and activities and mission projects and annual meeting and the uh, Great Lakes Youth event that's coming up. And General Synod is gonna be in Milwaukee in two years. Come to General Synod. If you've never been to a General Synod, you can all hop in a bus, organize it, come on up for the day. Come for one of the worship services. Come and see what the United Church of Christ is all about. It is an exciting place. It is an exciting idea. And I invite you to deepen your relationship, your understanding of this thing that you do that is not just First Congregational Church Downers Grove. Thank you for having me here this morning. I want to talk about our text a little bit this morning, Thessalonians. 
kind of important that we understand what the writer of this letter is up to. Now concerning the times and seasons, my brothers and sisters, you do not need to have anything written to you. These are a people understanding that their world was changing, their society was changing. What they had understood before was not working anymore and a new society was being born. Does this sound familiar? The future was uncertain. For you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And when they say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman. God, I love earthy Paul. And there will be no escape. We don't know the future. We make plans and God laughs. <laughs> we think we've got it all nailed down. I have a theory. This is Jim's theory of the way the world works. God gives you a tablecloth, one of those flimsy little tablecloths that you take outside and put on a picnic table in the wind. It has four corners. And if you're lucky, you are given three things to hold it down with. And what does that mean? One corner is always flapping in the wind. And so you have to kind of move one of the things to nail that one down. And then what happens? Another corner starts flapping in the wind. Isn't that the way our lives are? We're lucky if we have three things. Some folks only have one. Some have none. But you, beloved, are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So let us then not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation for God has destined us not for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord. I really need not preach anymore. These letters preach themselves. They are letters of hope. They are letters of joy. The writers of these letters always recognize that we are in the midst of life, and life is messy. Economies crash. Families have crises. Loved ones die. People get sick. And yet we have the promise that all of those temporal things, which are terrible to go through, I do not want to minimize anybody's misery. They're terrible to go through. I've had them, you've had them. But we're promised, my friends, that we are on a path, we are on a journey, that the journey is in light, and that when we reach the end of that journey, there is reward greater than we can imagine for ourselves. That is the entire message of the Bible. We are not stuck in a moment. We are not stuck in a place. We're not stuck in a situation. We are not stuck in a time. We are always moving forward. The quote in your bulletin from this morning from Abraham Lincoln, thank God that the future only reveals itself one day at a time. Preacher types like to make it sound like this is hard. Preacher types like to go on and on and on at length about the, this ology and that ology and another and we spend way too much money in seminary. <laughs> but 
My financial advisor just holds his head in his hands every time he looks at our debt. But the secret is that it's actually quite simple once you get down to the bottom of it. We have a God who loves us. We have a God who wants us to be happy. We have a God who wants us to be thankful. We have a God who gives us a new opportunity every single day to not screw it up as badly as we did yesterday. We have a God who promises us that in the deepest, darkest moments of our lives, when the misery seems intractable and the misery seems like it will overwhelm us, that in fact it will not. Everything else, how we worship, whatever us preacher types ramble on about every Sunday morning, whatever music we listen to, whatever mission projects we go out and do, and you should, is all predicated on the thought and the idea that God loves us. Kind of like Ben Franklin's corollary on this, beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy. But maybe beer isn't your thing. Maybe it's gardening. Maybe it's your cat. Maybe it's your children or your grandchildren or your great-grandchildren. Whatever it is, there is something in your life that is evidence of God's love and favor for you. So take a minute right now. Close your eyes. And I'm looking to see if your eyes are open. Close your eyes. Call to mind that thing in your life that gives you joy. Call to mind that thing in your life that gives you light, that draws you out of the darkness, that makes you feel happy to be alive every day. You got it? Now open your eyes. That is the thing. That is the proof in your life that God loves you, loves us, and wants you to be happy. It could be as small as a mustard seed. Doesn't have to be a big thing. Kittens are not very big. Grandchildren are not very big, though they get bigger if you keep feeding them. The people at the church in Thessalonica had lost sight of that. The people at the church in Thessalonica saw the world around them changing in ways that they felt that they had no control over, that they felt that they could not understand and frankly didn't want to. We've never done it that way before. (gasps) Quickest way to kill an idea in a church. And the writer of this letter had to write to them to say, "Mm, that is not the right way to be. You have a God who sets before you the ways of life and death, and frankly, it's more life than death. So be thankful. And take that thing, that joy. Maybe being here at Downers Grove on Sunday morning is the joy, is the thing that proves to you that God loves you. I'm not going to ask you to raise hands. The pastor's sitting right over there. But whatever it is, you take that joy. You blow on that ember and it will burst into flame. You plant it in the ground like a seed of mustard. And it will grow and grow and grow. That is God's hope for you. That is God's hope for us. That in the midst of this change, I don't know where the church is going. If I did that, I'd be the general minister and president. I wouldn't want his headaches for anything. (laughs) But I know that we are given whatever that is. And we cannot hide it. 
We must take it and plant it in our hearts and let it grow. And if we do that, you will survive and grow and thrive. The church will survive and grow and thrive. Our culture and our nation and our world will survive and grow and thrive. Thanks be to God. As we prepare to pray today, I draw your attention to page five, which has prayer concerns, continued prayers uh, for many in our church family. And as we pray, as, as Jim was reminding us of hope, I'll say one last thing before we pray. Remember that the church is not made of this stuff, this chancel, even these new lights. The church is an idea that is made of God's people, flesh and blood, love and grace, pain and joy, heartache and euphoria. But the hope of the church exists because the spirit of God's interaction with God's people. And so when you feel alone, or perhaps like the church in Thessalonia, afraid, the world's falling apart around you. Some of us feel that way sometimes. Remember that you are called to draw from a deep sense of God's hope, God's grace, and God's love for you, not to be kept, but to be shared. Let us take a moment of silence, and then we'll pray together. Let us pray. Grateful, grateful, truly grateful, as we hear through trained voice and piano tones, or through the winds of organ pipes, or guitar strings, through the mouths of children, bow ties and robes, and their younger, little older counterparts, through the choir, and in congregation, singing praises. God, may our prayers not always be, help, I need this. Do this for me and I'll, I'll do this, God. May our prayers be grounded in thank you and praise. For the one who's created the stars, sun, the planets and their wonder, to the depths of the sea and places yet undiscovered, to the troves of life and rainforest and savanna, to every different human being gathered here today from different places and experiences, marvelously and messily, even if that's a word, brought together as one body, united in faith, hope, and love. It's an amazing gift you give us, God. Every day, a new beginning, a new gift, a new opportunity to share the love that we've been given, the love in which we were created and named, and to give that to someone else in our community. Help us as we serve. Help us to encourage and build one another up. And in the grace and light of Jesus, 
Help us to continue to move forward. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. We also say a special prayer of gratitude for Pastor Kim Whistler Vasco. She has touched many in our church congregation. She's been a true partner in ministry. And in her months with us, she has shown brightly. I thank you for the gifts she has brought in here and ask your blessings on her as your spirit continues to lead her wherever it may draw her to use those gifts and strengths that she possesses. May we affirm those today as church family and share our gratitude with her. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, amen. Today, as we mentioned earlier, it is Consecration Sunday. So you will have seen, um, either you picked up last week or got in the mail or in the pews next to you, these pink forms talk about time and talents, talk about financial commitments. Every time one of us joins the church body, we answer a series of questions. And we realize that individually we are somehow less than we can be when we work together and are challenged by one another, grow from one another, hear faith perspectives that we might not have considered if we were operating just alone. And we draw together as a family, not bound again by flesh and blood, but by faith, and say we promise to work together in the building of God's kingdom here in Downers Grove with our time. It's a precious commodity and one you don't get back. Through the spiritual gifts each of us have, and each one of us has different gifts, thank God, because we are better together than we are apart. And through our treasure, through our financial commitments, saying we will help together to support the ministries and lives that this church affects, not just our own as we develop as disciples, but all those beyond these walls and those who come in through Hope's Front Door, ESL, PADS, Boy Scouts, so many others. And so as we share our offering and the choir sings, invite you to uh, bring your commitment cards up, put them in the little church. If you want, like the children, you can ring the little bell, they love it. And if you don't, and you're not prepared to do that today, please pray in the ways that you can help in the life as your part of this wider body, First Congregational United Church of Christ. Let us receive our morning offering this day as we come forward and share our commitment. Thank you. 
So I'm going to do something a little unusual and invite you all to stand and bless and dedicate these gifts together. Will you do so? So join with me and put your hands forward as if we were blessing these gifts, which is what we will do as we pray. God, pour out your spirit in blessing over these gifts. May they be like a mustard seed and grow and grow and grow. Let them be dedicated to building and sharing your love throughout the world and strengthening our love for you and sharing it with all. In Jesus' name, we give you thanks. Amen. Please stand. us today, one of our closing traditions as a congregation is to join hands with our neighbors to say that we are united as one body in faith through many different sizes and shapes and lives. And so as we sing our closing song, uh, Ancient Words, uh, we invite you to do so. Holy One, now let your servants go in peace, for your word has been fulfilled. Our own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.
Thank you so much for joining us in worship today. A special thank you to Reverend Dr. Olson for coming and visiting with us. And a huge, huge, huge thank you to Pastor Kim. You've done so much for us in the past months. We will miss you and we wish you the best of luck. A happy Thanksgiving to you all. But before we leave, come on up and join us in our postlude. You are good.
you. Happy Sunday and have a wonderful Thanksgiving.